Okay, good morning, everyone. Switch hands. Um, thanks, Randy. Um, I'm excited to be here. I love coming down here. I always find great inspiration here. Um, I'm going to talk to you today for about 40-ish minutes, and I'm just going to tell you some stories. Um, Randy mentioned briefly, and I'll just repeat, that I am not a formally trained teacher. I went to architecture school. We'll talk about why I went to architecture school in a minute. Um, and I sort of found myself working in public education, like, really by accident. Um, my mother's worked in education for my whole life. Um, my father's an entrepreneur, and so I, I guess I added architecture to that mix, and, and here I am. So um, I want to talk this morning about um, projects that have purpose and how we do those as educators and as adults who are both in charge of young people but also still learning ourselves. And I think we forget that so often, that we have a responsibility to be learners and to not get stuck in this like horrible rut that kids then experience as, oh, it's the same old thing. So the fact, this group, I, I can just make, I think, an accurate assumption that everyone that's in this room is here for a reason and wants to be doing work that feels fun for us and purposeful for kids and hopefully connected to the community in some way. So um, I'll come back to this tagline, but um, this is, I'm starting sort of at the end. I'll come back to this in a minute, but this is how I've come to think about my life and my work and my classroom and my kids that I want, to, I want to be able to break down my own fear about the things I haven't done, and I always want to be building. And I'm using the word build instead of make. I think the act of building implies a sense of ambition and a sense of, like, I can act on the world. And that's an important thing to experience as a young person and as a teacher. So um, let's go back to the early 90s. Oh, oh no, tech. Okay, hang on. I'm going to do this. How awkward is this? Okay, so um, I show this to my students now and they're like, who's that guy? I'm like, there's a new version of the TV show you should know, even though it sucks. I don't know if anyone's watched it. But um, so this is like, you know, I'm like nine years old, 10 years old, and um, this is my first crush. Um, so I'm putting, I, I realized in hindsight, of course, you don't realize this when you're nine years old, that. The, re the thing that I was drawn to about MacGyver, besides the Jeep Wrangler and the houseboat, was um, that this was the first time I had, I had seen someone, even if it was fictitious and on TV, solving problems in unexpected ways. And like if you watch Mythbusters, they've experimented to see whether his like gum wrapper bombs were actually feasible, and most were not. But, but this was, I was like, oh, there, there are other ways of doing things, and there's ways of using creativity to get out of sticky situations that I had never seen before. So in hindsight, I mean, you could say this is my first romantic moment with design and creative problem solving. Um, so I grew up in the woods in Northern, Northern California, and um, I was very lucky to have two of the most incredible grandmothers. My mom is French, or sorry, my mom is Chinese, my father is French. So this is my Chinese and French grandmothers. And, um, Again, in hindsight, you realize these things when you're an adult and you are like, oh, those are the things that formed me as a human. Um, and my two grandmothers were just, they were both librarians, which is a weird coincidence, um, but they were also both really, really creative and they were always making stuff. So my French grandmother um, was, a, was a really talented needlepoint and cross-stitcher, which I can't do to save my life, but she would do the most beautiful, like, large-scale tapestries and, like, just incredible work. And then... My grandmother on the right um, is holding a saw, which she played as a musical instrument. Has anyone heard a saw played? At a, as a, it's very weird. Yeah. So she would like bust it out at dinner parties and at Christmas. And if you didn't know what was going on, it was very uh, jarring. Um, but she also did Chinese calligraphy, and she was just she sang soprano. Um, both incredibly creative and brave women. Um, and then. I have two more things that formed uh, my young experience. These are my high school teachers from my junior year of high school. And these were the first people who told me that it was okay to be not just a nerd, but that it was okay to be a nerd about everything. So I had this problem as a high school student, which I, I know is like a good problem to have, but I was, I was interested and curious about everything. 
And right around junior year is when people start asking you, what are you going to be when you grow up? And where do you want to go to school? And what are you thinking about? And I was like, I don't know. Here's my list of 100 things. I was playing varsity soccer, and I was in the ceramics class, and I started the calculus club, and I wanted to read books all day. Like, I wanted to do everything. And so these were the first people to tell me, that's OK. You can be a nerd about everything. And so architecture, oh, it's working now. Architecture was the thing that I discovered after give, being given that permission um, that really was like at the intersection of all my nerdy loves, that I could draw, I could do math, I could learn about the natural world, I could go out and talk to people, I had to understand my community. And so architecture was this like center of this multi-circle Venn diagram, and I, I just found this thing that was like, oh, that's, that's how I want to learn and think about the world. So fast forward to 2008, um, I studied architecture, I went to graduate school for design, um, I worked as a, a furniture designer in, in architecture firms in like a lot of mostly boring residential, like some guy building his sixth house in Montana, that kind of thing. Um, I worked in retail for a while, I argue, argued a lot about doorknobs and dressing rooms, it was, it was awful, <laughs> it was horrible. Um, and I did that for a few years and then realized, you know what, I, I'm not going to do work that feels so fake. It just felt completely disconnected um, from all of the things that initially made me fall in love with architecture. I, I wasn't building anything, I wasn't talking to people, I wasn't working on problems that felt like real problems. And so I quit. Um, I had a 401k, I had a real salary, I was like, being an adult, and, um, and then I quit. I quit being an adult. So I moved back in with my family. I was 26, I had $1,000 in my savings account, and I started a nonprofit. This is like a recipe for success, right? So um, I started a nonprofit called Project H. I, I had no idea how to run a business. Um, at this point, I had no idea that I wanted to work in education, but I knew I wanted to do design and building work that, that mattered. That's the simplest way I can put it. So I set this nonprofit up, vowing to myself that I would figure it out. That was, that was my mission statement. I want to figure out how to do work that matters. And these H's came from like a napkin sketch and a brainstorm I had done with myself. Um, and I was like, okay, I'll call it Project H and I'll think of something better. And it's been nine years and I haven't, so here we are. So Project H, um, I do know what I'm doing now, which is exciting. And it took me a, a few years to get there, but I. I think the thing I realized about design and building is that it was inextricably tied to my youth for me, that there was something about having the opportunity both to design and think creatively, but then as you saw in the previous photo, I'm like covered in concrete and building, it was this gazebo that I built over a summer um, in Central America. I learned how to build, and so there was something about doing that at that age that was hugely transformative for me. It made me, it made me hopeful, it made me think that yeah, sure, I'm a 15-year-old girl, but I have agency in the world, and I can actually shape or be an author of, of the world. Um, so that's kind of the, the heart and soul of what Project H has always been. We've, we now have three different programs, and I'll show some of the work from them in just a minute. Um, we have a program called Studio H, which is an in-school, high school curriculum. Um, we have about 80 students per year, and over the course of August to June, we go from an idea, a, a snippet of an idea, to a ribbon cutting ceremony on a piece of public architecture that has been designed, engineered, and built all by high school students. Um, then I have a program called Girls Garage, which is a space only for girls, and we weld and build and pick locks and change oil on cars, and we do that in an all-girls space. And then lastly, we work with teachers. So we also, as I said before, we love to continue learning, and we love to help others continue learning. So we do professional development with teachers. So what does all this add up to? Um, so fear less, build more. And what I, what I think I mean by that is that we're all here talking about or thinking about how to do good, high-quality work in CTE. And so what I mean by fear less, build more is also to seek discomfort. Pretty much everything I've ever done under Project H, I have had zero, like, I, I went into it thinking this could totally blow up in my face. 
And the whole time, I'm going to be right at the edge of my comfort zone. And that's good. And then secondly, to have a reason. So I mean this not only for kids. Kids need to know what they're doing and why. But so do you as an educator. You have to be able to justify the thing you're asking kids to do and be legitimately invested in it as well. So I have four stories. There are four projects. Um, and they each sort of touch on one way in which we've thought about this that I think hopefully will be helpful um, as you go about your day here to think about your own work. So um, the first is to think, to think about projects that have an authentic community or audience or service. So this doesn't mean that every project has to be a community service project. It can have an audience that is real and in the world, but doesn't necessarily have to be explicitly a service project. Um, so the very first year of, um, no, I'm sorry, this is the second year that Project H existed. I got an email from the superintendent in rural North Carolina from area code 252. I'm like, where is that? I have no idea. And it was this guy, um, Dr. Chip Zollinger, and he sent me this email and it said, hi, Emily, I saw your work in Dwell Magazine. There's like red flag number one, what superintendent reads Dwell Magazine. Can you come down to North Carolina and fix my school district because the state is about to take it over and I've been hired to fix it. And I've tried everything. And I'm like looking, I'm like, what is happening? Is this a prank? I, why, why is this person emailing me? Um, but of course I said yes. And my, my former partner, Matt, and I flew down there. And um, we worked with him on various things. At first, we thought about, OK, let's do what we do. We're, we're architects. We're designers. Let's look at facilities. We built really cool new computer labs. We built playgrounds at the elementary schools. We built a new weight room for the football team. We did a graphic design campaign. And then we looked at each other, all three of us, and thought, you know what? This is all kind of a farce. Like, we can come down here and be creative. But if that's not in the classrooms, then it's kind of useless. And it's pretty arrogant, also, to fly in and say, OK, here's your new shiny computer lab. Bye. That doesn't seem right. So I moved there. <laughs> and I said to Dr. Zollinger, hey, can you make us high school teachers? And can we teach a design build class to high school students? And I was waiting for him to say no. And he said, yep, sure, you start on August 15th. And I said, oh, crap. Um, so I moved there, and so this is the, this year, if you want to see me crying and throwing my back out, and um, this is what is documented in the film, If You Build It, this project. Um, so I had 13 students the first year, all of whom were forced to be in my class because they were in an early college program, and they didn't have an elective teacher their junior year, so they made us the elective teacher and forced these kids to be in my class. Poor kids. So they all walked in the first year, the first day, and we all looked at each other like, none of us know what we're doing here, but we're going to do something really cool. Um, so I said to them, OK, who, who has built something before? And I get one hand from the kid who works on a farm. I'm like, OK, let's start with basics. So um, I said to them, by the end of the year, I want us to build something for this community. And we can all decide what that is. But before we do that, we have to learn how to make stuff and build stuff and trust each other. So we built these. I asked them to design a chicken coop. And if you ask any person, not just young people, to, to draw a structure or a house, they will draw the same thing. They will draw a square with a roof over it. That's like the archetype of a house. So I said, design a chicken coop. And I get this. And I said, OK, now do the opposite of that and do that 50 times. So these are some of the models that came out of this like very long and um, mostly frustrating process for them where I said, that's great, do it again. That's great, do it 100 more times. Do one inspired by the verb twist. Give me a chicken coop inspired by the verb hinge. Um, those verbs come from, there's, for those of you who know Richard Serra, he does those large scale um, steel sculptures. He published this beautiful handwritten list of verbs that he would use as like concept starters. So we used the same thing. We're like hinge, fold. These were fold and bend. So I'm fast forwarding, but this, these models became this coupe. Um, there were two others that were also very beautiful. Um, but these are five kids, four kids who had never built anything before. And in order to do this, they had to leave their assumptions of what a chicken coop was at the door and then learn how to draw in two and three dimensions, learn how to 
weld, use every saw in our shop, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, until this thing was done. So then they stood back and looked at it and went, oh my God, we built that. So now when I'm saying we're going to build a piece of public architecture for our community, they're not looking at me like I'm crazy anymore. They're looking at me like, okay, yes, let's do that. Um, so, and that's what we did. And so I asked, at this point I'd been living there for about a year and I lived right on Main Street. The mayor was our neighbor. Um, and so we, we had been having conversations with many, and this is a small town, this is like a town of 2,000 people. Um, we've been having conversations with many people, not just our students, about the economically depressed state of this small town. It's also in the deep south. There's, uh, I hate to say it, but there are all these sort of uh, expected racial divisions between the communities. Um, and so this is, this is where we're at. And so we heard from many people, not, not just our students, but actually the, it started with the mayor. The mayor said, you know, we used to have a farmer's market and you're from California and you guys have farmer's markets everywhere, but we don't have one. The closest one is 90 miles away. We have one grocery store that has a total monopoly and they know it and so they charge like $4 for an apple. And our other food options are Bojangles Fried Chicken, um, the local barbecue place, and that's basically it. The gas station, that's where I got my coffee every morning. So a farmer's market makes sense on a lot of levels. It could help start businesses. It could um, capitalize on all of the agricultural legacy of this place. It could bring fresh food. It could bring people together. There's nowhere for people to gather. There's no movie theater. There's no bookstore. There's no bar. There's nothing. So we started floating this idea and it became something that everyone was excited about, including farmers, including our students. Our students mostly were excited because they thought they could have like their school dances there. So, okay, whatever, great. Um, some of our families who were, were farmers um, were like, oh, this is great. We have so many extra collards that we'll sell there. So, back to basics. This is the same thing as the chicken coops. Design a farmer's market. I get this again. I'm like, okay, no, you can't do that. Let's go back to the verbs. Let's go to the state farmer's market. Let's ask every vendor there what's going on. Do they like the structure? What works? What doesn't? If you could have any farmer's market, what would it look like? Um, this is like design school one on 101. Oh, pointing the wrong way. So we have some sketches. They're very, very rough. And then we go and put them up on the walls downtown. And we invite people to come and look at them and give us feedback. So this is my student, Karan, on the left. And this guy named Jock, he's a, um, it's Jock, like, like sports, not Jock. He's very clear about that. Um, he was a, I know, weird. Um, he was a town council member. So I, we, we had this, this open forum and people came by and looked at all these drawings. This was, um, Karan used both SketchUp and he did hand sketches. Um, and I took this photo and I looked at it later and I was like, this is why this work matters because those are two people who never would have met. Like, I would bet my life on that. If not for this project, those two people would never have met. And if they had met, there's no way they would be talking about something that they were both so excited about and invested in. So I also believe that projects that have a real community and audience inevitably breed these like unexpected relationships that are fruitful beyond just this project. Okay, so we have many design charrettes and reviews and we have 13 students, but we can only build one farmer's market. So there's this like process of combining and refining and um, we inevitably end up with this, this design, which is very simple. It's basically a front porch. Um, but it had some really nerdy architectural details that I think made it really special to our students. Um, one of which is that, so it's hard to count here, but there are eight different bays that you could, so like eight stalls for farmer's markets, uh, for the farmers to sell in. And that was inspired by this particular type of structure that I've only ever seen in Bertie County, North Carolina, which is this like shed, this like butterfly roof shed where they would pull in um, trailers full of peanuts when they were harvested. And it was a really simple structure, but it was always eight bays and they were everywhere. So someone had taken a picture of them and said, we should make something like this. And I was like, yes, that is good vernacular. I'm like, let's, le let's learn the word vernacular. This is really good vernacular inspiration. This is something that is familiar. Um, 
but elevated. So we, we increased the roof height so that you had ventilation and so you have this natural billboard on the front. This became like a billboard to the town. Um, if you look at the, blue, the, the floor plan, it's not actually a rectangle. It has a seven degree kick to one side um, to allow for this, this really cool ramp up to it. Um, so it's, we called it uh, vernacular sublime. This is like familiar, but with a twist. Okay, great, so now we have a building and it's like May 31st and now we have to build it. So when I was in architecture school, this is where projects stopped. I would put this on a table and put some drawings on the wall and some architects I'd never met would come in and yell and you know puff up their chests and some people would end up crying and then I'd get a grade and go home. That's how architecture school was. And I promised my students that we would not do that. So the day after the last day of school, Everyone else is getting on their jet skis and we are digging holes. And it's North Carolina and it's June and it's 108 degrees and like 9,000% humidity. And we're like, okay, we'll see you at 6 a.m. tomorrow. It was awesome. So we dug holes for the foundation footers for what felt like forever. We poured the concrete. Um, this is after, of course, going through the whole building inspection and permit or building uh, permit process with the local building inspector. Um, we engineered these trusses for the building, which, so fun fact about North Carolina labor law, you cannot be a minor, 18 or under, on a construction site and operate a power tool. I have all 17 year olds, so I'm like, great, this is yet another challenge. Um, so these trusses are made up of 27 individual pieces of two by 12s, and because of our seven degree angle, all of them are different. So we have to prefabricate them in our shop, disassemble them, move them, code them with this like four star dash nine A asterisk, like ridiculous, move them to the site and assemble them with mallets by hand. Yeah. So then we have our trusses and then our, our new friend, our new contractor friend drops off this piece of machinery and leaves the keys on it and says, have fun. And so we had to learn how to drive that thing. Um, we raised the trusses into the air. We laid all of the um, deck joists. This was a great moment. This was like back to Carpentry 101. If I asked you for one at 95 and 3 quarters, don't bring it to me at 95 and 5 eighths because that costs us $27 and you have to do it again. So there was like a, it was amazing actually. There was a, such a level of care and precision and craft because our students knew every detail of this building because they had seen it from the time it was a model on their desk. And then we put up the siding for the um, billboard and the wraparound. And then this is the final structure. So, oh, thanks. <laughs> so we built this in three months in 110 degree heat with a construction crew of teenagers. And um, we also, I didn't mention this before and I won't go into it too much, but this was, um, a year in North Carolina when they had a 5.0 earthquake, which never happens in North Carolina. They had an F4 tornado. Um, they had a flood that destroyed the town. And this building had to be engineered in a flood zone and a hurricane zone to sustain 110 mile an hour winds. So I would say that only because the result of this is beautiful. But I think it's only beautiful because we had so many constraints and every single, at every single step we had to make a strategic decision within those constraints. Um, so on opening day, this was um, uh, September 10th or something, we, we opened the farmer's market officially to the public. And um, I should also say, we didn't just build the farmer's market, we had to start a farmer's market. Like, we had to have people who would come to it and sell stuff. So while we were building the farmer's market, and it was like half formed and coming out of the ground, we started a temporary market on the, like just in, on the parking lot to the side. And so before the building opened, people were coming to the site, to the temporary market. And every Saturday at nine, they would walk past the construction site and we were out there working. And even though they weren't building it with us, there was this like kind of, there was a spectacle to it. People would like, be like, what is going on? There's 16 year olds who are black, white, male, female. I'm the foreman. It was very confusing. And they would, but they were engaged in it, you know, and they would come every weekend just to see like, oh, what, did they, did they put the trusses up? Like, where are they at? So I love that. I love that there was, even if it was a passive engagement, 
there was, there was a conversation happening uh, with the community as, as this thing was coming to life. And so just, you know, this is my, a bunch of the students who built it, and there's Quran in the front, and the striped shirt, it's the same student who was talking to the town council member. He took the microphone from the mayor at the opening ceremony. He, he gave my students the key to the city, the mayor did. And then Quran took the microphone and said, um, on the first day of school, I thought Emily and Matt were crazy. I was like about to drop the class. And then here we are, and I want to bring my kids back here someday and tell them I built this. And I was like, yes, score. So that, that was like, he put that better than I ever could have because it, it is about pride and it's about feeling connected to a place and that wouldn't have happened if this was like my architecture projects where you stop at the model. So you have to have an authentic, I know this is like an extreme version of it, but you, you do have to have the accountability of a real audience and the service to a community and to think about how your ideas actually live. In, everyone has a million great ideas, but the ones that get put into the world that, that are seen by real people and critiqued by real people and used by real people. I think that's like the best type of learning we can offer to kids. Um, so following that, um, the next year, I had a new group of students in North Carolina and same thing, what do we want to build? I really wanted to build an animal shelter because there were all these hunting dogs that would wander into my backyard with like bear slashes on their necks. It's horrible. Um, but my students were like, yeah, no, that just happens around here. So <laughs> I'm like, okay, fine. So what they wanted to build, um, they said, you know, we, we love the farmer's market. I'm like, great, we're not doing another one. I'm not doing another farmer's market. And they said, no, 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 we want to do little annex farmer's markets because the, the county is so big. And if you're not, like, it can be a 45-minute drive to to Windsor where the market was um, if you're on the other side of the county. So they wanted to build these little 100 square foot pods that they could just put in town centers, or like six other small towns, like population 100 to 600. Um, so this was one of them and then um, this was the other. Actually there was one more. Um, so, but this was an important moment because when we did this project I made these two little pods, um, battle of the sexes. I said, one, girls are gonna design one and boys are gonna design the other. This is a total social experiment. Anyone wanna guess which group built this one? The girls, this was the boys. So the girls is like all rational and everything's a right angle and they built the, the squares individually. They're like, let's break it up into pieces and we'll each do 20 and we'll put them together. And then the boys was like this voluptuous, like, whatever. Anyway, they're both gorgeous, but I thought that was very interesting. Yeah. Um, okay, so, authentic audience. Um, the last thing I'll say about that is I, I know that over the course of both, both all of these projects, um, there was the expectation and, like, constant elephant in the room that the work that we were doing in the classroom was eventually going to be out in the world and that there would be strangers standing inside it. So... Even when my students got frustrated, they knew that, and that is what brought them back to doing a good job. Like, this thing will be in the world. We can't screw it up. Okay, so secondly, um, so not only having a real audience or a real community, but we also want to be doing real work. Like, one of my pet peeves is when I see student projects that are like fake work or fake skills. Like, there's, there, okay, I'm going to apologize in advance if anyone has done this, but I see a lot of 3D printing projects where kids are making like basically keychains, right? And I'm like, okay, that's cool. I, like if I were eight, I probably would have thought that was cool. But is that uh, under the umbrella of CTE and project-based learning, is that real work? Like do people actually do that? Is that a legitimate, I don't know. I, I could debate this in my head for many hours. But um, so I think the things that, that are really powerful to kids are things that they can point to and say, I learned how to do this in my class. I could see myself doing this in the world, in a career. Or maybe not in a career, maybe as a hobby. But that these are real skills. And so um, fast forward to 2012, um, after being in North Carolina for three years, I'm happy to tell this story. This might be like an over a beer story later, but we left North Carolina um, for a lot of political reasons. Um, it was very bittersweet, but they're doing quite well now, but it was, it was really hard to leave. So we brought the program to um, Berkeley, California, which 
it's a very progressive place. It's like at the total opposite end of the spectrum in all ways um, from Bertie County. But we brought the program to a school called Realm, R-E-A-L-M, it's a charter school. Um, and interestingly, most of the kids that attend Realm are not from Berkeley. They're from Richmond, and they're recent Mexican and Latino immigrants, or they're from West and East Oakland, and they converge in Berkeley. So it's a really interesting group of, of kids that do not share a home community, much probably a lot like here at High Tech High, you have kids coming from all over. So the idea of community is, is much more complex. Um, many of my students in Richmond live in pretty awful, well, in Oakland as well, live in pretty awful public housing, many times with multiple generations crammed into a really junky apartment. And so I asked my students the same thing I asked in North Carolina, what do you want to build for our community? What do we want to build? And all, almost all of them said something about my housing situation, we just got evicted, I've been in foster care, my mom's homeless right now. There was, the idea of home was so tenuous to them. And I said, okay, let's talk about home. Let's design, let's design a home. Who should we design this home for? And so we found this organization in um, Oregon called Opportunity Village. Um, I'm sure some of you are into the tiny home movement right now, right? So Opportunity Village uh, bought an old mobile home park and turned it into a tiny home village for um, homeless individuals. And they, you can live there from six to 12 months and they help you with job training and, and a lot of different things. Um, so we said, oh, do you need an extra tiny home? And they said, funny you should ask. We have 25 spots and we have 24 houses. I was like, great, we'll build you one. And so we got to know some of the leadership and some of the people living there. It's, it's an awesome organization. It's also one of the only towns, um, Eugene, that like legally has a municipal zoning code to have tiny homes. I wanted to build one in Richmond, but we would have had to do it illegally, and I didn't want to put that burden on a family. So anyway, this is not the one we built. This is one of the ones that was already there. They're pretty slapped together. They're very, very small. And so we said, we're gonna build you a tiny home on a trailer, it's gonna be amazing. And they said, great. So we were in conversation with them the whole time. And this is, this is a similar process to what we did with the farmer's market. The difference here, well I guess this is not a difference now that I think about it, but um, I will say that a lot of my Latino students have uh, relatives or parents or brothers or sisters who work in the construction trade. And so they would say, oh, my dad does this all the time. I know how to do this. I'm like, do you? Maybe you do, let's, let's figure it out together. And it turned out that, they, that they, they knew, they had a proximity to some of these skills, but they didn't have the technical, the technical know-how to like take this into AutoCAD and then to look at a set of construction documents and actually build something. So this is what I mean about real skills. Like we can, we can say, oh, we're gonna build whatever, but if I am not preparing a student to then go out and say, I know AutoCAD and Revit, and I can look at a set of CDs, and I can wear a hard hat and look at a project management Gantt chart, then to me that feels like summer camp, right? Like we have a duty to teach them these skills. So these are some of the models. We had a full design review. These are some of the drawings. Um, I have 85 students now, and so how in the heck am I gonna build a 100 square foot tiny home with 85 students over four class periods for where I have them for 65 minutes each. Like I can't think of a worse way to set up a construction site, right? <laughs> but that's what we have. So these are the framing plans that we came up with where so that every time the bell rang and second period became third period, those kids could come in, look at the drawings, look at the building and know exactly where to pick up where the previous class left off. Um, Color-coded hard, hard hats, one of my favorite things. So, so that we, this is like the same moment as the farmer's market. Now we have to lift this thing into the air. And this is also a legitimate skill, like how to behave on a construction site so that you don't drop a wall on your friend's foot, right? This is also why I love architecture, because it, this requires a totally different kind of trust. Like if I'm gonna pick up this end of the wall and you're gonna pick up that end of the wall, you, I have to trust you enough that we can do this physical task together. Um, so squaring this thing up. And then um, one of the design arguments that we got into as a class is they, we had a really limited budget, like really limited. And one of the students said, well, Miss Emily, I, my dad works in a warehouse, can we use the pallets for siding? And I immediately had this flashback to grad school when I tried to make furniture out of pallet wood and then like 
thought I had tetanus and it's just all bad, right? So I was like, you guys can do that, but I'm not touching them. Like you can get them here and you can take them apart and you can plane them down and cut them and stain them, but I'm not touching a single pallet. They're like, okay, cool. So they took apart 200 pallets, they cut them all down, they stained some of them, they pieced them together, and this is the final siding, which I was like, okay, I like pallets again, great job. <laughs> um, so, and then we actually built two that were like mirror images of each other, one that we gave to Opportunity Village and one that was um, sold to a, a single mom um, in Pasadena. So the inside is like super basic, right? We're talking about a bed and, um, and some storage. Here are the two in um, Siamese twin form. No, so great question. So we did not put in a kitchen or bathroom, even though we, we drew it and we spec'd it to include it, but because Opportunity Village is this communal living, they have shared services, so they wouldn't allow us to put one in because they didn't want it to be like the, yeah, the, the extra special one, yeah. Um, and then this is the, the individual who's living in the one in Oregon. Um, so I want to point out one thing about the design of this, though. This is, so back to my comment about, oh, everyone draws the square with the roof, right? If you look at these two things together, that's basically what we did, right? And so halfway through this project, we looked at it and we're like, oh, that's, that's the thing we wanted to try to avoid. But... In reality, this is, this is what it is for one person. And I kind of love that if, if you are a homeless individual and you are thinking about wanting a permanent home, maybe that is the perfect archetype. Maybe that is the image in your head. And so we can get you, metaphorically and maybe literally, halfway there. Um, my students, though, you know, in terms of real skills, we had a real client and we were in constant conversation with them. So I want to just say one thing about the design of this. The windows, which go across the top, and then there's that stripe down, which is the, um, the door and the like, side window. Originally, we had a lot more windows. And so being in conversation with the client, they said, you know, that's beautiful. It's really well lit and we don't always have electricity. So the natural light is great, but we have a problem with privacy. And we don't want people coming up and like peering in windows. So is there a way for you to make it both private and naturally lit? And so my students had to really think about that and go back to their um, initial designs. And this is what they came up with, that to have a glass door and this strip of light that's south facing and then a very small window. So I don't just mean real skills like AutoCAD. I mean real skills like there's a real person expecting you to meet their needs and you have to listen to them. Okay, um, the third thing, these last two stories are much shorter. I, I'm almost done, I promise. So um, the third thing is that I, I think that the work that we ask students to do should also, in a way, ask them the question, what kind of human do you want to be? I don't mean values in the like religious sense or even like the heavy-handed ethics sense. I mean like what kind of, what kind of human do you want to be in the world? Um, so after... Our first two years at Realm, um, we did a little experiment and we decided to, to run the same class with eighth graders, which in hindsight, we, we're, I'll just say we don't do that anymore. Um, I love middle school kids, but something about eighth graders with power tools is like not my favorite combination. But this was a really great group. So we had this group of eighth graders and I started asking myself this question very early, like how eighth graders, you're at like such an important moment, you're about to go to high school, how like... We need for you to be thinking as a 13-year-old about what kind of human you want to be. So, same question. What are we going to build for our community? And many of them said, we are a charter school, we're in a commercial space, and we don't have a library. We want a library. And I was like, okay, I want a library too. So, why do you want a library? And they said, well, because we love books and we want to learn, and we learn in classes, but we want to learn in other spaces too. Okay, this is awesome. So, so we go to the local public library and we do like circulation maps and drawings and sketches and we take notes and we come back and I say, what did you, what do you think of that library? And they all said, we hate it. And I was like, what? That's a beautiful city of Berkeley public library. What's wrong with it? And they said, it feels too clean. And then they elaborated. What they meant was that they didn't like that you were supposed to come to the library, you like either talk to the librarian or you look up the number on the, the Dewey Decimal and then you go and you find it and then you take your book and you check it out and you leave. And they're like, that's... One of them said, it feels like going to the doctor. 
I was like, oh, okay. So it was like a very linear, like sort of prescriptive experience for them. And maybe that's because that's how they'd gone to the library with teachers, like go find To Kill a Mockingbird, okay, let's go. And so what they said, and this is where we started having conversations about values, was we want a place that is not about go find To Kill a Mockingbird, but actually a place of discovery and exploration. We want a library that feels like a place to explore. And I said, all right, well, what does that look like? So we started playing with space plans. How do you do that spatially? Like, how do you balance private space, public space, natural light, um, low elements, high elements, shelves, furniture? How do you do that? And then I have 108 eighth graders. This is the same as the tiny home. I have 108 eighth graders, but we have one thing to build. So how on earth do I get every kid engaged in a design when there's 108 of them and they all have different ideas. So one of them brilliantly said, well, Miss Emily, how about instead of all of us designing the entire library, like let's all come up with a design for a library, let's design a building block. And we can make that building block like a fancy Lego and we can put them together in all different ways and then every student will feel like they had a part in putting this thing together. And I said, that is brilliant. So this is a CNC uh, router that we use to prototype um, this really simple shelf, which was supposed to be a cross. It was supposed to be like this. And then when we made one and set it down, it naturally sat like this in an X shape. And we looked at it and said, that's way cooler. So then, as, and a student said, well, that's perfect too, because we're in algebra and we're learning that X is the unknown. And so this is the space where you go for the thing you don't know. It's the X space. And I was like, you're hired, and you should go into branding. That's amazing. <laughs> so, so this is the prototype of, and this is two pieces of wood that like interlock together. Some have a concave, concave um, facade, some have a convex, and so when they lock together, they make this really cool wavelength. Um, so you can make a shelf out of them. You can make a shelf slash bench that goes underneath the windows. You can make a desk, like a double-sided desk. You can fill an entire wall with them. We invited the seventh graders in just to experience the space as a place of reading. You can make them into exhibi exhibition fi uh, fixtures for student work and zines. And then this is the final library, which I took this photo. This is like a year and a half old photo. And the library looks nothing like this now. I meant to take a picture before I came down here to show the difference. Um, but what I love most about this, this project is not that, I mean, I love the shape of the X shelves and I love that it's like a really unexpected thing. But what I love most about it is every time I go in there, it looks different. I'm like, where'd that new shelf come from that has all those graphic novels? Oh, so-and-so built it. Or where did that shelf go? Oh, Mr. Darden took it to his science classroom. It's like constantly evolving. And so, as, like, the architect in me who wants, like, the perfectly finished photo is very troubled by that, but the values and the principles that my students originally said, we want this to be a place for exploration and discovery, that is exactly what this library has become. So it's a place that they are constantly editing. Um, they're able to think about what they want it to be, and then they can make it that way. And so that was something that they identified. We don't, we don't want to be the kind of students who go to the library just to get to kill a mockingbird. We want to be the students who go to a library to find things we didn't even expect to find. Okay, then lastly, um, so I'm, I said very intentionally work that amplifies voice, not work that gives voice, because we all already have a voice. I think for young people it's just about making that voice louder. Um, so I'm also interested in work that is highly personal and that gives students the ability to like scream their life story and their opinions and their whatever to the world. And to do that in a way that feels safe and celebrated. So um, this is the sort of final chapter of my work and I think what I'm most excited about right now. Um, over the course of building these, all these projects, this is from the tiny home project, um, I would do this little social experiment where I would pull a group of girls out, just like three or four of them, and say like, hey girls, let's go work together over here. And I, I started to notice that they behaved very differently when they were with me in a small group of just girls than when they did in the co-ed space. 
And it bothered me because the difference was that when they were in the co-ed space, there's always exceptions, but for the most part, they, would, they were not volunteering for the things I knew they knew how to do. And in a lot of cases, better than some of the boys. They were just like, no, it's okay, whatever, he can do it. Um, and they would put ideas out there and then quickly retract them. Like, what if we did this? Okay, no, never mind, you're right. And that really bothered me, and they wouldn't do that when it was just this kind of group. So I decided to start um, an after-school and summer camp only for girls to do basically the same work, but only for girls, and starting younger, starting at like age nine. So I wanted to see if I could catch them early and if that would make a difference later. Um, so this is Amber and Fiona. They're some of our, my first campers. They were nine years old in this picture. Um, they built a playhouse. Actually, Amber, who's on the left, um, our partner was a was the local women's women's shelter for homeless and abused women. She was living there with her mother, and um, the project was to build a playhouse for the women's center. And I asked her how she felt about that, and she's like, "Oh, it makes me proud." So we wanted to be able to offer the space to girls who wouldn't otherwise have access to it, and also to continue to think about how this space can give back to the community. Um, so we use gigantic chop saws that are like bigger diameters than their heads. Um, we almost always start with MIG welding because it's like one of those things that feels outside of your reach but then makes you feel like a superhero when you're a 10-year-old girl. Um, oh wait, I, went, I missed one, sorry, let me go back. That's a weld done by a nine-year-old. Pretty good one, yeah. Um, we ask girls to work together in ways that are uncomfortable this was a group that was finished early, and I said, okay, go weld something together, figure it out. And that's what they made. They made this sign. It's very hard to see because you're looking at it the, at, the, at a funny angle, but they made this sign that says fearless, which I did not, like, that was all them. It just happened to be perfect. Um, and then some, some furniture that we built for the women's center, the, um, caught this concrete top coffee table. We replanted their, their garden. Um, and made random gifts for people that we sometimes knew and sometimes had just met. Um, and then lastly, so this, is, this became like a labor of love. I was like so in love with this space and these girls and what the kinds of conversations we were able to have together. Like what does it mean that we're all, that we're all young women, sometimes all young women of color doing these things together? Like are there other places where this exists? How, what is this contributing to your life? It became such an amazing space to be in. So the architect in me also decided that um, this had to be its own space. I really, this was like the Virginia Woolf, A Room of My Own, um, or Sandra Cisneros' new book, A House of My Own. Like there is something very political and um, certain about saying these are four walls and they're ours and we, we belong here, and we are this group, and this is our space. So I really wanted to say to the girls that had already been in the program, we have a space, it's ours. It's not also a church, it's not also a classroom, it's not also a community center. It says Girls Garage on the, on the front of the building, and your name is on the wall. So this is Girls Garage. We, the program is four years old, we just moved into the space in the fall, and um, this has been a space where we have been very overt in saying, you come in here and you tell us the thing you want to do and the thing that you believe, and you're going to be able to do that here. Like, no matter what, I don't care what it is. And um, so <laughs> these are some of the nine-year-olds. Um, but what happens, and I think the power of voice is not, is not just the fact that, like, I'm, I'm saying to a student, you have permission to have a voice, say the thing you want to say, but that that's contagious, and it spreads. Like, when you give one person voice, it becomes like a whole chorus, right? So I have nine-year-olds doing carpentry um, who then grow up to become 16-year-olds who, who, who keep coming, and this is all furniture they built. This is like this 90-minute blitz project they built. Um, and then those girls bring their mothers, and then those mothers bring their whole family, and they make skateboards together. And it becomes this like intergenerational conversation about what it means to be a young person, a young woman, a young woman of color, a grandmother, a mother, all engaged in this work together. And I think that is what all this stuff adds up to. And I'll just add this last piece that this, I think this also applies, this goes beyond just the family to teachers. These are the high-tech high teachers who 
came to our space um, about a month and a half ago, two months ago, um, and did some of the same work that we do with 10-year-olds and mothers and high school students. And so this, you know, it's easy to say, oh, well, this is a fourth grade project and this is an adult project and this is a high school project. But to me, it all feels the same and it all does center around this, this idea of amplifying voice and that those voices aren't just like being shot into a vacuum. They're, they're voices that another person is hearing and then they're going to go and do something with that as well. Um, so I'll just end with where I started with this idea of fear less, build more. I think this, um, this is something we preach to our young people. We, we, tell, we will literally say to them, when they're like standing at the chop saw and hesitating, I'm like, look up at that wall, what does it say? But I also mean that for, for all of us. Like everything that I just showed you, I did while being terrified. And so you'll note that I am not denying the fact that we're all scared, we're, we're all terrified. But the point is we have to act even while terrified and to keep building the things that we know that we believe in and that are going to give our kids the kinds of lives and learning that we know they deserve. So, thank you. Okay, I think we have time for a couple questions if there are any. If not, I will be here till tomorrow. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, great question. So the second tiny home we built, um, we did not know who, who the buyer or client for that house was going to be. We built it as just a mirror image of the other one, and then we advertised it as this is what it is, this, these are the features. And um, she was a woman who, she and her daughter lived in Pasadena, and they were getting evicted from their house. And she, she bought the tiny home and put it in the backyard of her sister's house. So she lives there with her daughter in her sister's yard, basically. Yeah. Anyone else? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Did you get a lot of donated materials, or where did you get a lot of your stuff for these projects? Yeah, so money is always a thing, um, as we all know. So I'll just put it out there. Um, we, so our annual budget is about $400,000 a year. And we have three full-time staff people and six like rotating instructor people. Our insurance rates are very high because we weld with nine-year-olds. Um, and so, yeah, the funding has pretty much every year, it's like we have to look at what we've had and then what we need and piece it together. And it's a mix of, right now, it's about 30%, um, actually, no, more than that, I'm sorry, about 40% grants. So that's anything from the National Endowment for the Arts, which may be going away. Um, to family foundations, um, grants, yeah. And then the rest is a mix of either corporate sponsorships, so like uh, the Autodesk Foundation, that's technically a grant, but it's a corporate grant. So Autodesk Foundation, um, Ryobi, Lenovo gives us a lot of our hardware. So some, a lot of times with the corporate donors, it's like a mix of we need this amount of money for whatever and we'll give you this equipment. Um, and then individual donations. We have a lot of, a lot of our funding comes from individual donations that are like $50, $60. Um, and then some, a small portion that's um, service fees. So like if, if not all girls, in fact a lot, do not pay to come to our camp, but some do. Um, so, there's, so there's that, yeah. It's an ongoing battle, yeah. Yeah. That's me, yeah. I do all our grants, um, accounting, PR, web maintenance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, these? Oh, yeah. These are just um, woodworking workbenches. So they have they have a shoulder vise and a tail vise, and then they have holes where you can put bench dogs that like help secure things. That's our band name also, the Bench Dogs, in case you're, yeah. yeah. But where did you guys make them, or did you, where did you We bought them. So we were going to make them, and then we actually had a Woodcraft, the company. Um, I emailed them, and I said, we're going to replicate these tables unless you want to donate them to us. And they said, okay, sure. So, yeah, we paid, like, 20% of the cost. But, um, yeah, they're, they're incredible tables, yeah. I can give you the brand name and stuff if anyone's interested. Anyone else? 
Yeah. The girls' camp is um, off of the Gilman exit in Berkeley. So if any of you know Berkeley, it's like right around the corner from the Whole Foods. Um, yeah, it's on 10th Street in Berkeley. And just like the, the daytime program, I, Berkeley's such a funny place in so many ways, but I like being there because it's like really the nexus of the 80 corridor. So we have girls that come from as far as Vallejo and as far south as, for summer, they come from like San Jose and all the way up, like San Leandro all the way up. They're a week long, yeah. So we have um, three weeks that are for 9 to 13 year olds. It's like a design build transform camp where we build projects for the Women's Center. And then we have two weeks that are um, no cost by application for teen, teenage girls. Yeah. And then we have an adult summer camp if anyone wants to come. Yeah. Last call. Anyone? Okay. I'll be here till tomorrow. I'd love to talk to all of you more. So thank you so much.